So we have to talk about how to get the expected frequencies. So this is called a contingency table. It's also called a cross classification table. All right, like you might see this kind of stuff in SPSS, or this is like this is much more common. If you go into a work setting, somebody might ask you to set something up like this. Okay, uh, so data are often referred to as cross cross classified categorical data. But all you're saying, right, is that if you look down here, 17 kids fell into the high academic performance as well as the high self esteem category. That's all it is. Right? And essentially, we get it by counting it up. So here we have self-esteem and academic performance. So, the, so in getting the data, the data would be something like, we have a child. Would you rate them as high self-esteem, low self-esteem, medium self-esteem? And they would just be put into a category. And the same thing with academic performance. We're just rating them as high or low. Now, the truth is, you, know, you might find different measures to do with this. Like academic performance, you might take GPA or class average or something like that, right? But in this case, they're just putting them into categories. Okay? So the only thing that we have to do here that's a little different is we have to find the expected values, the expected frequencies. The way to do this is by this. We take the row sum. These are sums on the side here. The row, and by the way, this sum down here, that's N. That's N. So I had 150 kids that I cross-classified like this. So the way to find the frequencies is I take my row sum, multiply it by my column sum, and divide by n. Very simply, okay? So for example, <coughs> sorry, just trying to see what my notes are doing. Okay, so for example, if I start here, right, this is my row sum, this is my column sum, so I do 60 times 30 divided by 150. Which equals 12. So I'm just going to put them in parentheses. Sometimes it's, e you know, it's easier to do this because you need to be able to subtract your expected from your observed, so we put them all in the table like this. Okay, and let's do another one, right? So let's say medium. So that's the row sum, and that's the column sum. So I do 60 times 75 divided by 150, and that gives me 30. Now the truth is, ow, you could do that for every box. Do you have to? Why or why not? Look at the numbers for a minute. I know a lot of you are doing Sudoku or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to add up to the, the row means and the column means. So you could just do subtraction for the others. OK, so let's fill them in. Right, like 12 and 18 is going to equal 30, because that's the total it has to be. Does anybody have any questions on where those numbers are coming from? I always think this seems really easy, but then sometimes it's too fast. Okay? So now we just have to do our chi-square. So we're going to do, and it's just this. Right? This is my chi-square formula. It's the same thing. It's the same thing as we had before. But just now I have six terms. And make sure you put the right expected underneath.
So you see we're calculating it exactly the same way we did before. The only thing that was different here was how we got our expected frequencies. The other thing that's a little different are my degrees of freedom. Okay, my degrees of freedom for this two-way chi-square or this test of association is this. Okay, what does big R stand for? The number of rows, the number of columns. So what is this going to be? Two. Two. Now the truth is, every single example we've done used a chi-square with two degrees of freedom. So it's going to be the same critical value as before. Right? You could have, this just happened to be uh, two of one variable and three levels of the other variable, but you could have a three by four or four, you know, right? You could have many different levels. What's my conclusion here? I reject, but what am I rejecting? What am I saying here? Yeah. Almost. Don't use the words interaction, though. How about independence or association? Yeah, did you want to say? Yeah, I don't know that I would want to use the word correlation because people will tend to think you, you calculated a correlation, but you're right. There's a relationship, right? These two variables, there's an association there. They are related. They are not independent, or you could say they are dependent. That is, there's a relationship between self-esteem and academic performance. Okay? Questions? Questions on that? Okay. All right, you're almost done here. In the simplest scenario, you could do a two by two. Right, two, vari two levels of one variable, two variable, two levels of the other variable. Sorry, a little tired. Okay, so you could use this formula. Now, what this formula is, n is the total number of observations. It imagines your two by two in this format. Right, if you have a two by two, it's set up like this. So it's saying that the way you think of it is a, b, c, d. So you just take the product of a times d minus the product of b times c squared, and then a plus b, c plus d, right? You, you do that. That's the only thing you would do. So it's kind of, it may be easier than doing all the chi-square terms. Um, I don't know. You'd have to see. Sometimes when you do those chi-square terms, again, there's subtraction. People tend to make mistakes. But that's, that's another thing. OK, assumptions. And since we're not doing. Are we doing an example? Yeah, we could do an example. Let's do an example of it. Here, here's our example. A little two by two. numbers here. Okay. In this example, a researcher wished to find out whether there was a significant relationship between younger and older subjects with respect to whether they would return valuable lost letters. Right? They, they set up an experiment, something like uh, a lost letter is sitting somewhere, and they saw whether a person returned it or not, and they found out their age. Now, the way they described younger and older, younger was under 30, older was over 30. 
All right, so that's how they classified the people. So this is, this is what the results showed, right? That younger people returned it about 19 times, older people returned it about 20, right? So the question is, is there a relationship between age and whether they returned it or not? So the really simple way of doing this is just to use this formula. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. Not crazy about the deception ones. <laughs> Don't forget the squared if you're doing it this way. So you didn't have to find the expected frequencies here either. Right, so this is just a simple two by two, so you could use this other formula for the simple two by two. Yeah, it's 56, right? Because n is 56. OK, so a chi-square of 0.085, what do you think, significant or not? Not likely, right? But just for completion's sake, my chi-square critical value would have how many degrees of freedom? Yeah, 1. The chi-square critical value is 3.84. So it's not significant. So again, so what you're saying is, but there doesn't seem to be any relationship between age and whether they return the letters or not. Okay? All right. Assumptions of the chi square test. Right? It doesn't have the same assumptions like the parametric tests have, but there are a few assumptions for this that you really have to meet if you want this test to be valid at all. So the first one, mutually exclusive and exhaustive categories. If somebody falls into one category, they cannot fall into another category. Right? Those, those categories have to be mutually exclusive. If, you decide, if you're a registered Republican, you cannot be a registered Democrat. All right? The other one is that they're exhaustive. For the thing that you're studying, it has to exhaust all possibilities. Like if you were doing um, number of children in the family. So you might have one, two, three, four, and then you might have five and up, right, that exhausts all possibilities. Okay? So that's an assumption when you do this. Independence of observations, all right? That is, a person can fit into one category, only one category. So for example, if you violate the, if, like, if somebody gave, gave me the answers on our snack food, well, I really like potato chips and cheese doodles. I couldn't put the person into both those categories. That would be, that would violate independence of observations, right? Because you show up in two places. So that's not good. So that's a violation, right? So violation seriously undermines the validity of the test. When that happens, it's a really bad thing. So that's like an example of kind of sloppy design. Right? If somebody can fall into more than one category, you have to go back and figure out, OK, I haven't figured out my categories properly. Or I haven't figured out the criteria for my categories. The other thing that I'm just going to talk to you about, I'm not going to hold you responsible for all the details of it, is the size of the expected frequencies in each cell. Right? The observed frequencies are what they are. That's your data. But the expected frequencies, what you expect, should be a certain size. For example, an expected frequency for each cell should be at least 5 if your degrees of freedom are greater than 1. 
and 10 when your degrees of freedom equal to 1. That's one example of a limit on how small your expected frequencies should be. But there's people who give other things. Haber is more lenient, all right? He says the average of all the expected frequencies should be 5. That's a more lenient criterion. There's a compromise. No expected frequencies less than 1 and no more than 20% less than 5. Okay, so there's a lot of different options. If you're going to do something like this, you have to find out about the discipline you're working in and other research to see what satisfies the requirements for your discipline. Because people might be stricter or more lenient depending on what you're doing. Okay, and we talked about this. I don't know, Kim, if you were the one who asked about this. Um, sometimes you combine categories, right? Like if you find out that your categories, like you have nobody in one category. If you have one person, you might combine it with another category. But you're not allowed to combine categories just to get the answer you want. Okay. Some uses for the chi-square test of independence. So you can use it to see a relationship between two categorical variables. Understand that, right? We've had different tests based on the kind of variables that we're talking about. Now we're just talking about these categorical variables. Um, so that's one reason that you might do it. Another reason is that you've done a study, and you were going to use a t-test, or you were going to use an ANOVA, and then you found out that you violated those assumptions. So then you might go to a chi-square to do it. Okay? You lose power, but it's useful if your n is small and your distribution is not normal. All right? Now, I'm going to make an executive decision. We are not going to do anything. I'm not going to hold you responsible for anything past this. So the strength of association, just in case you want to know, is effect size. Effect size for a chi-square. That's really what it is. But so we're going to stop here. Okay, so for people who came in late, I said I'm doing a final review. There's a sheet up here. I handed it out already. Yes, you've gotten through the semester. I know it's not over yet, but mostly it's done. All right. So let's go through this. We're going to work through this. Uh, whatever we don't finish now, we'll finish on Monday. Okay. So here we go. First question. The autokinetic effect refers to the fact that if a subject is placed in a totally dark room and views a stationary point of light, the light appears to move with random jerky movements. Okay, you understand that, right? It's, it's, the light seems to move. Okay? Dr. Smith wishes to know whether the distance the light is perceived to move, how much it moves, depends on the color. Because right? we find this actually wavelength of light can change our perception of it. So this uh, researcher wants to know whether the amount it moves depends on the color of the light. She selects nine subjects and presents each color of light to them in random order. The apparent distances moved in inches are shown in the table. OK. What are we doing here? How many variables do I have? What two? You're going to tell me two. Which ones are? It's just one, right? And when I say variables, I don't mean the independent and the dependent. How many independent variables? 
if that's what's confusing you, right? The dependent variable was what, by the way? Hmm? Yeah, the amount of movement, the number of inches it moves. That's the dependent variable. The independent variable here is the color of light, right? The color of the light. So we have one variable here. What type of design is this? This is E, but I'm answering E first because I want to make sure you understand. Even give me part. What, what are we doing here? What analysis needs to be done on this? It's a repeated measures design, right? Each person sees all the colors. Hmm? Make sure you're getting that from the words. You need to read these things carefully. So it's a repeated measures design. Which type of repeated measures design? You had various options. Randomized blocks, successive, simultaneous, quantitative. Simultaneous, right? She's presenting them all in the same session in random order. Simultaneous presentation. Okay. By the way, folks, and this is just a test taking measure, all right? If you weren't sure which ANOVA you should be doing, what do you look at? Like I said, this is just how you take tests. What might you look at to help you? The summary table. Right? The summary tables are set up differently if you have a one-way ANOVA, if you have a repeated measures, or if you have a two-way. Look at the summary table. Okay? So, all right. So, let's go. Let's fill in the ANOVA for this. Yeah. Well, again, look. Um, she selects nine subjects and presents each color of light to them in random order. If she presented them all in a variety of orders, that would be successive, right? One after another. But this is random. OK? All right, so let's do the computations on these. And what do I give you here? Do I give you anything? Total. Yes, I give you total, because I am nice. So let's start up at the top. SS sub. Anybody remember NT times the variance of what? Because again, this is our between subjects. The row means, the row means, right? The subject means. OK, let's get this clear. How many subjects do we have? Nine subjects. How many colors? Four. What's NT? Yeah, 36. So how many row means are there? Yeah, there are nine row means. Here's the variance of these row means. So that's SS sub. What about SSRM? NT times the variance of the column means, yeah. How many column means are there? Four.
let's fill those in on our table. get us this interaction. Yeah, I take us this total and I subtract the other two. Okay, questions on where any of those numbers came from? All right, let's do the rest of the table. How many degrees of freedom for between subjects? Yeah, good. Right, because it's the number of rows minus one here. Okay. What about for treatments? Degrees of freedom for treatments. Good. Because it's the number of treatments minus one. And what about for SS residual? 24, yeah. Because it's the degrees of freedom for sub times the degrees of freedom for RM, the treatments. Okay. What is our total degrees of freedom? 35, good. How do you get that, by the way? NT minus 1 or? <laughs> Bless you. Or what? Add up all the other degrees of freedom. How do I get my mean squares? I divide. I divide my sum of squares by my degrees of freedom. F is the ratio of these two, right? So that's my F ratio, okay? Now what? What do I have to do? I have to make a decision. How do I make a decision? Yep, how many degrees of freedom? Three and 24, 24. So this is question C. Is there a significant difference between colors? Yes, OK. What would the next steps in the design be? A good, good educated guess, right? But what particular, right? Because what was the problem with the repeated measures? No, we don't know where it is, but no, in terms of, in terms of which post hoc tests to do, what's the problem? Yeah. Which post hoc tests do I do? Very good. Yeah, that's the safest option, OK? Because what did it depend on? It depended on whether you met the assumption of sphericity. Sphericity. If you have sphericity, then yes, you could do an HSD. If you did an HSD, what would be under the square root sign? It has to be a mean square. Which mean square? Which mean square would it be? Hmm? Hmm? Somebody said it. Yeah, residual. Right? Because it would be the mean square. It's the error term from this ANOVA.
You don't do MSB, well, it's MS between treatments over MS residual. Because this is RM, right? This is the repeated measures part, the treatments part. That's what you're testing. Okay? So let's go back to the post hoc test, right? So if you have sphericity, you can use any of the other post hoc tests, but you have to use MS residual in it. If you don't have sphericity, and this is always the safest option to say, like what you said, you do match T tests with a Bonferroni correction. Or a Bonferroni adjusted alpha. Okay? Any questions on that example? Yes. You can't from this. You can from this, but I'm asking you what the options are. Yeah, I'd have to tell you you have sphericity or you don't have sphericity or assuming it or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be the same format, except that you'll have more time, and but there's more stuff, but you will have more time. It's like people don't run out of time as much. Okay. So any questions on this example? Anything else? Okay. Let's do the next example. Yeah. What do you mean within subjects part to trick you? It has to be there, right? Here, let's go back and look at it for a second. Within is there. This is between the subjects. Within the subjects, I just am not giving you the total of what it is because you're not going to use it. If you, went, if you did chapter 16, you would understand that we use that. But here we don't use it. But these two things are actually combined to create my within subjects. What would the next step be? Yeah, all of that stuff. Either match T with a Bonferroni, or if you had sphericity, a regular post hoc using MS residual. That's what Samantha just asked. You, I would have to tell you. I haven't, I haven't taught you how to assess sphericity. We've just talked about it as an, as an assumption to talk about. OK? OK, good. The next question. Suppose you're manager of the American Psychological Association annual convention. This year you make a concerted effort to get young students to attend the convention by creating activities designed especially for them. You'd like to know whether your efforts to attract younger students were successful. You know from past years that among the students who attend the APA convention, 10% are freshmen, 20% are sophomores, 30% are juniors, and 40% are seniors. We take a random sample of 100 students at the convention and ask them to tell us their standing. OK. What is this? It's a chi-square, right? It's a chi-square. And so I'm going to need my expected frequencies. What are my expected frequencies going to be based on? Your representation in the population in past years. OK? So what are the numbers? Yeah. I gave you easy numbers. OK, it just works out nicely that way because you have 100 people, 100 students. If you had 125 students, how would you do it? Yeah, multiply the percentage or take it as a proportion out of the n, the total n. OK, so now we just do the chi-square.
What's the next question on it? Yep, what are the degrees of freedom and the chi-square critical value? So what are the degrees of freedom here? Hmm? Three, yeah. So what's the answer here? Does the student attendance at this year's convention follow the same pattern as in previous years? No, it doesn't, right? The distribution is different. And if you just take a look at the numbers, just for your own understanding of what's going on, right? They were hoping to attract more freshmen this year than they had in the past. Did they do that? Did they accomplish that? Yes. Right? This is this year's, right? That's what they observed. This is what they expected based on the past. Right? But this year they were trying something new and special to get the freshmen in. But again, what would you have to do? Because you don't know exactly where the differences are. What would you do? Right? This is significant. They're different. This, this observed distribution is different from the expected. What would the follow-up tests be? <laughs> what? No. Yeah, someone said it. Can you use an HSD or an LSD? Again, we're still stuck with these categorical data. That's the only option. We follow it up with more chi-squares. You can't follow it up with another interval ratio test. right? You just follow it up with chi-squares, but you just take two groups at a time. And what? So you do chi-squares with two groups at a time. What else, what's the adjustment I have to make? The Bonferroni. I have to take alpha, and I have to divide it by the number of tests I'm doing. Because again, whenever you do these multiple tests, think in terms of making sure that you're not increasing that type 1 error rate. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? You're taking two at a time. So you're doing freshman and sophomore, freshman and junior, freshman and senior, you know. Okay. Okay. Questions on this one? Good. All right. Let's look at the next example. Previous research has determined that children can bond with their caregivers in different ways, uh, secure, anxious, or avoidance styles. For the non-psych majors out there, is there a psych major who can talk about what this means, bonding with caregivers? Anybody remember any of this? Yeah, one of you. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something called the strange situation, yeah. Um, and then, so some of them were secure, so like they would cry or, you know, when they left, but then when they came back, they'd be happy that right. the caregiver put them back. And then the anxious ones, I think, would, would cry when they left, but I'll still be crying. Yeah, they'd be real clingy. Yeah. They'd be real clingy and insecure. Okay. Yeah, and when the caregiver came back. So this is what happened, right? So this strange situation, and there are a variety of different ways this was played out, but it was something along the lines of this, that um, mom would walk in, and it was usually mom. They did dads later on, but they started with, um, with mothers. Mother walks into a room with the infant, and a stranger comes into the room. Mother leaves the room, leaves the infant with the stranger. Mother comes back, how does the child respond? So that's called the strange situation, right? Because it's leaving them with a stranger, what happens? 
Okay? So children who were uh, what they call securely attached, that means that they had a strong, secure bond with their caregiver, they cried when their mother left, but when the mom came back, they could be pacified. Okay? The anxious children, when the mother came back, they really couldn't be pacified. They were still really, really upset that the mother had left. Okay? Whereas the avoidant children, when the mother came back, the child would act like they, they would avoid the mother's face. It's a real kind of strange thing to see. It's like they, they just try to avoid any contact. And it's really, like if you see it, it looks pretty anomalous because we're used to kids either being clingy or be happy that their parent is back. So it's a very uh, kind of unnerving thing to watch. Okay? But, so those are how the kids could be bonded. All right? So this researcher was interested in whether the different attachment styles or the different bonds affect children's sleep patterns. Right? You might think that children who are securely attached might sleep better than those who are not. So what do we have here? Uh, the sleep patterns of 10 secure, 10 anxious, and 10 avoidant five-year-olds were monitored. Of primary importance to the researcher was the overall percentage of time that each child spent in deep or delta sleep. The following SPSS output has the average percent of time spent in delta sleep for each style, as well as the results of an ANOVA performed on the data. OK, so let's take a look at what we've got here. Okay, So we have the analysis, and we have our group means. Let's take a look at what the questions are. What is the conclusion of this study? Okay, Include rejection or acceptance of the null hypothesis, and what this means for this study. Right? Only using the SPSS output, how do we know whether the result is significant or not? Yeah, you look in the SIG column, right? You'd be amazed. I have people, like, uh, this seems very obvious to a lot of you, but I'll have people that will still give me a critical value. They'll still look up a critical value. No, you look in the SIG column. And what do you compare that to? Yeah, so what's your decision-making rule? Well, what is the rule here? Yeah, if my SIG value is less than alpha, I reject the null hypothesis. So what's my conclusion here? In work, you said reject. This study, be specific. What are we talking about here? Yeah, right? There's a significant difference in delta sleep. Actually, what's the dependent variable? Look at it. Not just delta sleep. Tell me what it is. Percentage. Percentage of time spent in delta sleep. It's not minutes. It's not seconds or hours. It's percentage. All right? So there's a significant difference in the percentage of time spent in delta sleep as a function of attachment style. Which, if you take a look at those means, should not be an enormous surprise. Right? The secure child spent 22.6%, anxious 15.9%, avoidant 17.5%. Okay? So, what's the next question here? Calculate an LLSD and determine which groups are significantly different from each other. All right. Why am I using an LSD, by the way? Because I only have three groups, yeah. OK. Where do I get my t-critical value from? How do I find it? Hmm? 
the T critical value. Degrees of freedom, which degrees of freedom? Within, good. So how many degrees of freedom is that? 27, 27. So my T critical value is 2.052. Where is MS within coming from? Yeah, so that's in the table, the ANOVA summary table. And then the question, all semester, what is M? Good. So 1.58, what? 1.58, what? Percent. Percent, yeah, percent difference. OK, so let's, right, the next thing we have to do is find the differences between pairs of means. So secure minus anxious. Significant? Yes. Secure minus avoidant. Significant? Is it doing weird things again? And then the last one, anxious versus avoidant. What do we think? Yes, just. Right? Just. Okay. So yeah, so what you're finding is that there is a significant difference among all the groups in the percentage of time spent in Delta sleep. Okay? And you know which is better because you have those group means. That's why you report the group means, so that everybody else can also see which is better. Okay? Now here's a question. If I was going to do a contrast, Comparing anxious and avoidant to secure, what would the coefficients be? Comparing secure to anxious and avoidant. Yeah. Can you explain how you got it? Seems obvious, right? Yeah. OK, well, let's, let's take it back for a minute, right? If I want to compare secure to anxious and avoidant, right? What I'm doing is I'm saying the mean of that group minus the average of these two groups, right? So if I expand that out, right, this is ostensibly has a 1 in front of it. So that would really be minus 1 half, minus 1 half. But again, if we want to put this all in whole numbers instead of fractions, <coughs> what would you do? Right? You just multiply by the common denominator. You multiply it by 2. So that's why you get 2 minus 1 and minus 1. Okay. All right? Questions on any of this so far? Yeah. Yeah, you might do a contrast with three groups. Here, it's, it would not make a whole lot of sense because it's pretty obvious what's going on. But in a more complicated thing, yeah, it could. OK? Questions? All right. So we're gonna just going to stop here. You guys are going to do the evaluations. We're going to finish up on Monday. By the way, if there's anybody who didn't fill out a, um, a release form, I need you to do that. I have them up here, okay?